Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. Yes, 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 yes. What a game. What a performance by the Philadelphia Eagles. They keep the dream alive. They keep the playoff hopes alive as they beat the Dallas Cowboys. That's right, I will say it again. They beat the Dallas Cowboys by a score of 17-9. to Defensively, they were remarkable. We've been ripping Jim Schwartz apart every single week for the last few weeks, and he was magnificent in this one. And Dak Prescott did miss wide open throws. The receivers did drop some passes, but all around, his scheme was really awesome. He dialed up some really impressive looks, and it confused the Cowboys' offense at times. They didn't score one touchdown. The same offense that abused the Los Angeles Rams last week could not get in the end zone once, so Jim Schwartz was awesome. Carson Wentz delivered, and when you talked about this game before it started, what was the headlines? This is the biggest game of Carson Wentz's career. That's what it was, because essentially it was the closest game to a playoff game. He's never really made it this deep into a season, except for his first year, and that was a totally different circumstance. So, because of him being healthy, and because of needing to win to keep the playoff dreams alive, it was the biggest game of his career against a rival at home. And what did he do? He was truly a leader out there. 31 of 40, 319 yards and a touchdown. Did the offense stall at times? Sure, it did stall at times, but he also put together great drives and he's working with Davis, J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, Greg Ward, Dallas Goddard, wow, what a game. Miles Sanders, wow, every single week he gets even better. He gets more explosive. He reads gaps smoother. I mean, it's unbelievable how talented he truly is and the difference he he really made throughout the season. Literally every week he adds something different to his game or he Im- Im- improves to another degree. He was special. But a- as a whole, when you look at the entire package, it's not this insane group of weapons. So for Carson Wentz to only miss nine throws and to put together that type of performance in a must-win game in the biggest game game of his career, you have to tip your cap, and Carson Wentz absolutely delivered. That is now three weeks in a row. The Giants came back and made it happen. The Redskins, late drive made it happen. And against the Dallas Cowboys, I know it's only 17 points, but all around, when you watch the game and when you see the type of throws that he was making... These are solid throws, putting it where it needs to be, hitting Dallas Goddard in the right spots, throwing the ball over the middle and and hitting specific guys right in their chest to get the first down, hitting Dallas Goddard. This, This was a work of art by Carson Wentz, even though the offense only scored 17 points total. You could see he was dialed in. You could see he was locked in. And even listening to pregame, as I was driving home from 97.3 ESPN's pregame show, Countdown to Kickoff to to Get Home, I was listening to the pregame show, and they were talking about, and this might sound silly, and even they were ripping it because it it sounds so funny, but they were talking about how focused Carson Wentz looked in warm-ups. How he looked, his mechanics, his focus level, what his eyes looked like, how determined he looked. And it's funny because it's just warm-ups, right? I mean, you're just going out there, going through the motion, getting your arm ready, moving your body in the right way, stretching out. So how can you look so dialed in? But apparently they weren't wrong because the way the Eagles came out, guns blazing, hitting J.J. Ortega Whiteside, of all people, for some catches. And then I, I guess the adrenaline stopped for J.J. because after that he went absolutely quiet. Quiet. But the way the, the Eagles came out flying and really moving the football, it, it was awesome. This was just a totally team game. It was a team effort. Everyone contributed on both sides of the ball at every position. And that's what makes it taste even sweeter. There is so much to talk about. And it will be very enjoyable. But before we dive more into it, I need to let you know how I can give you free money. If you use the promo code BRODES at SeatGeek's checkout page, you get $20 off of your total purchase. So you're getting free parking, free beer, free food. Who doesn't like free beer? Come on. Use the promo code BRODES today. All right, so we'll we'll talk about the defense here. They allowed three field goals. 
They created a turnover. Now, Fletcher Cox leaves the game. And this was during a moment where everyone was leaving the game. Ronald Darby, Jalen Mills, Fletcher Cox left, then Tim Jernigan went down. They were dropping like flies. Fletcher Cox leaves the game, ends up coming back, and impacts it instantly. He forces a fumble right after half, after the Cowboys actually had some rhythm, seemed to make some adjustments. They were pounding the rock better than they did throughout the first half. And right by the Eagles' end zone, Fletcher Cox strips the ball. The Eagles recover, and I was getting nervous because we all remember last year when Kamer Grugier Hill runs down and forces a fumble in Dallas, and they said they couldn't see who overturned it, or if it was overturned, they couldn't see if it was recovered. That's the word I'm looking for, as there were, what, six Eagles on top of it? So I was getting nervous, but it was a clear shot of a recovery at the bottom of the pile by the Eagles. What what an insane play by Fletcher to leave the game, to impact it as soon as he comes back. And we were calling for it. It's been a quiet season so far in terms of Fletcher Cox status. I know he made the Pro Bowl, but he's been way more elite throughout his career. It's been a quieter season for him. Going into it, we said it must happen. We need it to happen. We need Fletch to wake up. We need this defensive line to get pressure because it was sad against Washington. So that's why I decided when when discussing this game, I put the Fletcher Cox jersey on because I thought that that was such an important play in this game. I actually had on the Carson Wentz jersey, and, and even though I loved his game and I loved the way he responded and I loved the way he's been playing over the last few weeks— I had to go with Fletch because that play turned the game around. It, it it changed momentum, and you can hear the crowd roaring and going nuts and being drunk and belligerent, and it was beautiful to my ears as I was sitting in my basement going crazy. But but that happened. I thought the defense stopped Zeke. At one point in this game, he had negative one yards on four carries. Then he ended up getting a 10-yard play, so we finished the half with five carries, nine yards. They were tackling. That was an issue for this team. So the defense was tackling. They were forcing a turnover. And then how about Sidney Jones? Sidney Jones, after these cornerbacks are dropping, Rasul Douglas gets beat a little bit. Sidney Jones at the end of the game on fourth down, his receiver gets targeted in the end zone and he makes a heads up play, swats it out. So Sidney Jones now gets thrown into the mix, thrown into the fire, and delivers on a play. This was a solid play. Now, they reviewed it for defensive pass interference, which was a sick joke. He made a great play. He had his head turned around. He got his hand on the ball. So the corners were making plays. It wasn't just Sidney Jones. That one stands out, of course, because of the conversation going around with Sidney Jones. But Avante Maddox had a big breakup on a third and one play. Malcolm Jenkins got his hands on a lot of balls as well. Like, it, it was really remarkable what I saw out of the defensive backs when it comes to getting their hands on the ball, like pa- or, or passing up the, the play. Pass breakups. It happened. It happened. Now, there were times where the DBs got beat, and then some of the Cowboys dropped the ball. That happened as well, specifically when I look at that late drive. Where was that late drive here that I have on my notes? There was... How much time left? 4.33 to go in the game, and a couple of the DBs got beat, but here's my thing. I saw the Cowboys go underneath, 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 and they were moving downfield, and it was an eight-point game at this time, so there was some nervousness involved. The heart was beating fast, but you either get waxed over the top, and they score on a big play and grab a ton of momentum, even though they needed a two-point conversion as well, or you let them catch it underneath, let them catch it underneath, and then you end up fighting for your life in a red zone situation where the Eagles normally do thrive. So they were moving the ball downfield. They eventually got the stop by Sidney Jones, but I don't disagree with the way the Eagles played that out when I look at Jim Schwartz because you just can't get hosed over the top for one play and allow them to score and have a chance for a two-point conversion. They did get lucky. That happened twice, actually, on both sides of the field. And The Cowboys didn't have their strongest game. Dak was totally poor in this one. He was missing throws. I don't know if the injury played a factor. Was he just off? The drop passes were obnoxious. It seemed like that was the Eagles all season long. I mean, really, those were the type of passes we've seen the Eagles drop 
every single week until this back stretch here. There's something about December when it comes to this Eagles team. There's something that has to do with the way Doug Peterson has this squad playing. Now, going to Doug Peterson, I know I'm all over the place, but I'm so emotional right now. It was such a crazy game. Uh, my my heart is, is beating so fast. There's so much fuel in me because it was such an exciting journey throughout the last few hours. But we'll go to Doug Peterson because I thought he made some brutal decisions. Even though he has this team playing good in December and January, it seems every year. They're always fighting, and I mentioned it, home dogs. Whenever it's a home dog situation, home underdogs, this team thrives. But going back to Doug Peterson, okay, he had a really bad decision in the fourth quarter when the score was 17-6. to It was fourth and five, and he threw Jake Elliott out there for a 55-yard field goal attempt when he already missed one from 50-plus, and he's been off. He's been bad. Ever since he got paid, kicker boy has not been good whatsoever. So, I look at Doug Peterson in that situation. The score is 17-6. to the, the Cowboys were not able to really move downfield. They weren't getting chunk plays. They weren't running the ball successfully. I know Doug's identity is, is to either go for it, be aggressive. I'd rather see him go for it on the 4th and 5, but my main issue is... Really, at the end of the day, even though I would have liked to see him go for it on 4th and 5 because I know that's his identity, I'm basing that off his identity, I would have punted. I mean, the decision is to punt because it's not like the Cowboys did anything offensively to that point in the game. So you pin them inside their own 10. I'm saying go for it on 4th and 5 instead of kicking the field goal just because I know how aggressive Doug Peterson is. I would have lived with that over the 55-yard field goal attempt. But the easy decision to me was no-brainer, punt it. Pin them. Pin them. You're in control of the game. Don't allow them to get momentum. And of course, what does that do? It allows them to get momentum. So Doug was bad in that spot. And then in the first half, on third and one, he ends up throwing the ball, nobody in the backfield. Fourth and one, throws the ball again. And it wasn't even close. It's third and one. Fourth and one. At some point, at some point, there has to be a run dialed up. Now, old-fashioned me, I'm running the ball both times. I'm finding a way to hit a gap, get the first down, live for another day. You saw the Dallas Cowboys do that a couple times. Zeke needed a half an inch. Well, they give him the half an inch, and then bang, they live for another first down play. At that point, I don't understand not having anyone in the backfield for the third and one, throwing it, missing, and then doing it again, throwing the ball again on fourth. Doug made some boneheaded decision and decisions in this one, and it, and it really confuses me at times. He always overthinks. He always overthinks. But hey, he beat Jason Garrett. How about it? Now, there is no way that this guy is coming back, right? I mean, it's obvious that Jason Garrett is getting canned. It's done. The Cowboys have too much talent. Now, the talent didn't execute. I, I put that more on the talent playing poorly. For Jason Witten to drop passes, Gallup to drop passes, Cooper to drop passes, for Dak to be off. I mean, that goes on the players. I am a firm believer in players play. Like That's always my first target. In football, though, the coaches do get more criticism because they have such a bigger role in the game and they have more impact in the game. But when I watched this one, it stood out to me that the players were not playing well. Now, that doesn't mean Jason Garrett's free because he's been here for so long and the team has been dreadful throughout his tenure as a whole. So, yeah, he still needs to go. But this game specifically, it goes towards... In my opinion, it goes towards the players just not being ready to compete. Maybe it was the hostile environment, or like I stated, maybe Dak Prescott just wasn't feeling right. But it, it was bad. Going back to the defense, Josh Sweat had some action. Vinny Curry got a sack. It, it was crazy. Every, everyone contributed. When I say full team effort, full team effort. Let's flip back to the offensive side of the ball. Dallas Goddard was amazing. Nine receptions, 91 yards. There was one drive, and it was under the two-minute warning in, in the first half. He got targeted like five times in a row. Goddard, 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 Goddard. Now, sadly, there was a Jason Peters holding, which brought everything back, and, and then there ended up being a, a, the, the missed field goal involved there that that was the first missed field goal I believe so it was it was just unbelievable the way Dallas Goddard ended up playing 
throughout this game. It, it was something that we haven't really seen out of him before. Now, maybe Zach Ertz leaving for a while because of the rib injury played a role in that. And, and that's hard for, for Doug Peterson to lose Zach Ertz for a significant amount of time in this game. That's tough because of the way this offense is built. 12 personnel. They love the two tight end sets. Losing Zach Ertz, it changes a lot. It changes how this team does things. Now, you have Josh Perkins, who is a half wide receiver, half tight end, and but that's not the same, right? Zach Ertz is a powerful weapon, arguably the most powerful weapon on this football team. So losing him is a big time issue, and it changes a lot of things when it comes to a game plan. So when I was watching the offense stall at times, when I watched them struggle when he wasn't really in the game, it's such a hard thing to adapt on the fly, but I was questioning Doug Peterson. Can he adapt on the fly? Can he make something happen? Well, Zach Ertz ended up fighting through it and, and battling and playing with this rib injury, which was insane. He did come back, but all around, Dallas Goddard stepped up, and so did Miles Sanders. Listen to these stats. Miles Sanders had 20 carries for 79 yards. He had five receptions for 77 yards. He had a stiff arm. He was throwing people around. He even had the slide, right? He could have had a touchdown at the end. He goes for the slide just so the Eagles can finish the game off without running up the score. <laughs> Think about it. The Eagles were at that point. Now, obviously, it wasn't to not run up the score. It was because it was a very smart play. All the Eagles had to do at that moment was to snap the ball and they win the game. That's why he did it. I'm sure he would have pounded the scoreboard up if he was able to, if it was the smart thing to do. But his football IQ shows slide, let it go. Don't worry about the points. And let's move on to the New York Giants. And and I know the New York Giants game is is something that we need to look at because this was so emotional. Hopefully there's not a downside to, to that, but this is to enjoy the Cowboys win right now. There's plenty of times to look into what the what the New York Giants game is all about. But for right now, this is special. This is a very great win. The Cowboys have had our number for a few games in a row now. They they swept us last season. They whooped our ass earlier this year. It was a great response. I thought the crowd was magnificent. They really came out to play. They really came out to party. It was a playoff atmosphere. I was so jealous that I was not in attendance, and I think that they were a very hostile environment for that Cowboys team that really could not get anything going. Greg Ward. Greg Ward had seven, uh, 71 yards, 71 yards for four receptions. So he provided some spark as well. Early in the game, he had a big third down catch, and, and he was making it happen. It's crazy to think about the injuries, where the team was falling left and right. It's crazy to think about what they went into before this game even started when it comes to injuries. And for them to still win, for them to pull together, wow. And there is power in how strong this locker room is. There is some sort of power going on because of the way that these players are playing for Carson Wentz. You just didn't have it with Alshon. You just didn't have it with Nelson Aguilar. The tricky thing now is what's going to happen with Jordan Howard. Not that I want to dive into more future things. Like I stated, this is to appreciate the win, to really feel the moment, to embrace it because it, it, it tastes so good. It feels so good. But what do you do with Jordan Howard? I feel like Miles Sanders shows that he can be the stud. He can be the guy. He can make the plays. I don't I don't know what you do. Right now the team is gelling so well. They're playing really solid. What do you do with something like Jordan Howard if he is capable of coming back? But once again, once again, come on. We can't be doing this. We can't be thinking of the future right now. Right now, it's about this magnificent win and the way that they held Zeke to 47 yards on the ground and 37 yards receiving. Zeke averaged over 160 yards against the Eagles throughout his career. Okay? He's been literally destroying this football team every single time they played. He hasn't lost to the Eagles. The way the mindset was for this defense, you could see it right out of the jump, right out of the tunnel. It was to tackle, to wrap him up and bring him to the ground, and do not let Zeke go at all. And they did such a great job of that early on. Coming out of the half, there were some moments where he he lowered his shoulder, he made some plays, he made it happen. A little, just a little, but nowhere serious, nothing crazy. So, 
you look at Jim and you say A+, plus because his back was against the wall. There's no denying it. His back was against the wall. He was being questioned. Would he be here? And who knows, if, if the Eagles don't make playoffs somehow, will he be here? I don't know the answer to that question, but I know when you look at this game and going into the game, it was a really brutal question that was being asked, and there's no denying he answered the bell. I give Jim Schwartz more credit than most people do in this city. A lot of people outrage. He stinks. He sucks. He's the worst. He has some flaws in his system. There's definitely no denying that. But when it comes to being a football mind, a football guy, he's a really solid defensive coordinator in this league. Now, he's been here for a while. New messages can mean a lot. It doesn't mean he's a bad coordinator. But all around, I give him way more credit than most do in this city because with what he's playing with, with Jalen Mills, Sidney Jones, Rasul Douglas, Ronald Darby, who was awful and ended up leaving the game, it's not like he's working with A-plus talent and he's not doing well. His scheme works when talent is there. When it is effective because he has talent, his scheme is very solid and it is productive. But you got to really tip your cap to Jim Schwartz in that defense because to only hold them to nine points all game long, it's, it's something else. But this just shows you that each game is week to week. Each week is week to week. The Dallas Cowboys totally destroyed the Rams, scored 40-plus points, and then they come in here and, and scored nine. Now, right now, the Eagles are on a rhythm. They're on a roll. There's a ton of momentum. You know if you win, you're in. So there's a lot more on the table. But my point is, because something happens one week, it doesn't mean it will happen the next week. My gut feeling told me the Cowboys were going to win, but deep down, something silly was in my stomach. It was almost as if I didn't want to admit it. But I thought, like, there's a way. There, there is a way. I feel like they're, they are going to do it. But when I broke it down logically, it screamed Cowboys. But I just thought there would be a way somehow. And that's absolutely what happened. Wow. No Lane Johnson, right? You got Vitae on the right side. Now, one time Vitae got abused by Demarcus Lawrence. Carson Wentz got hit good. But he also had some strong plays as well. The offensive line won the battle for Miles Sanders to get into the into the end zone for that one goal line play to really squeak Miles Sanders in. And, and the play before that, Miles Sanders was really trying to work his way into the end zone. Three Cowboys are dragging him down. They got their hands and their arms surrounding his shoulders and ripping him down to the ground. He was working. He was churning but couldn't get it through. So for the offensive line to respond the next play, move the gap, it was like the sea was wide open and he squirted right in it. Jason Peters, though, I respect his Hall of Fame career. I do. But wow, did he have some moments in this one that made me cringe. <laughs> you can see his age is definitely playing a factor in his game because he had some moments where it's wow. And one of those, actually, Carson Wentz had his back turned. Jason Peters gets totally beat off the line, and Carson fumbled. Now, a lot of people, most people, and deservingly so, rip Carson Wentz for the fumbles and how many times he puts the ball on the floor. But in that situation, it happened so quick. JP got beat so quickly off the line, and that's his blind side, right? I mean, that's how important left tackles are. They're uh, that important for a reason. Is that Carson's fault? I mean, he barely had any time in his offensive line. His left tackle is getting torched. Luckily, he ended up hopping on it. But that one's almost as if, to me, it's on the O-line and not really Carson. It's on JP. But regardless, what I think about this game, there's something special in that locker room right now. It seems to happen a lot in December when it comes to this football squad under Dougie P. We'll be talking about this more. No doubt about it. Let me know your thoughts down below. Thank you so much for watching. Hit that thumbs up button and subscribe. I will see you next time.